Hi, Karen from ediblewildfood.com here. And today's video is going to be something a little bit different. I'm not going to speak about plants that are edible. Leaves of three, examine thee. That's my say on that leaves of three saying. And the reason is simple because alfalfa, leaves of three, red clover, leaves of three, um, what else? There are other plants out there, leaves of three, strawberries, wild strawberries. So it's really important as foragers to get out there and understand poison ivy, what it can do to us and how to identify it. This video will help you to identify it at different stages of growth. And if you are interested, I sell a $5 PDF on my store and the link will be below. And if you purchase the Poisonous Plants $5 PDF, my gift to you is a $5 PDF of your choosing. So when you fill out the order form, the additional information, not only do you put poison in there, but also put the name of the plant of the PDF in which you would like to receive. Let's go. Alrighty. So in the United States, poison ivy can be found in almost every state. And here in Canada, in every province, with the exception of Newfoundland. And apparently this is even in the Yukon territories. So this grows typically in sandy soils, woodland edges, and most definitely right in the woods as well. In many forests, sparse woodlands, wherever the conditions are favorable, you will find poison ivy. So always keep in mind if you're foraging, and not that there is, but let me just say, for example, you saw something orange and yellow in the distant background there, and you're suspecting you found a big stash of chicken of the woods. Are you going to go racing through all this? No, not unless you are dressed properly. Okay, poison ivy has actually been split up into two different categories. There are two distinct species. Toxicodendron ridburgi has leaflets that are somewhat folded and it doesn't climb. So as you can see, these do have a tendency to fold over. So I would suspect that is the specific species of this poison ivy. And then there's Toxicodendron radicans, which has leaflets that are flat when fresh or when, when they are first uh, growing. And one thing that actually, another uh, distinguishing factor between the two is that the radicans has soft little hairs and I'm not, let's see if I can, on those stems. And radicans is the species that actually does the climbing on trees. Depending on the season, now I will admit I went, I found this when I was hiking, so I pre-picked it and brought it here because I thought it was quite rare to see that there's still some poison ivy with some reddish tinges to it. And that definitely, let me do this, that definitely is a springtime feature of poison ivy. And yes, I have touched it. And yes, I will explain why in a little bit. So that's the springtime growth typically. And then in the summer, of course, it's green. And like deciduous trees in the autumn, the leaves turn yellow, orange, or red. The plant produces berries. Like right in here. Let me just get rid of this soap port. There we go. And the wildlife love these berries. Right now they're green, but when they're ripe, they will be white. You can see there's quite a few berries being produced.
and you'll notice the stems are more than more than uh, often wood. So now let's talk about some cool poison ivy facts. So now I'm on the other side here and plenty of poison ivy over here as well. There's a strawberry plant hiding amongst the poison ivy. So the first fact, poison ivy really isn't poisonous. It's the oil, the long lasting oil that is on this plant called urushiol. This is what causes the itchy blistering rashes. And even after slight contact, it, well, sometimes it's, I think more than often, it takes usually 12 to 48 hours after exposure for that rash to begin. But that's on average. That's not to say that it could happen to you right away either. Fact number two. If you have this, let's say, in your on your property and you want to get rid of it, do not burn it under any circumstances. There is a lot of documented history about First Nations peoples, both in Canada and the United States, using poison ivy as chemical warfare. Now, of course, that wasn't the term used back in the day, but one thing for sure, they knew if the winds were favorable, by burning poison ivy, the smoke would be so toxic that when their enemy was approaching, it would burn their lungs to the point that many of them ended up dying. So never ever burn poison ivy. The oil, the urushiol, adheres to your skin within minutes. And make no mistake, it can touch your clothing, it will stick to your clothing, stick to your backpack. And there is documentation that says the oils can stay on a surface, transferred onto a surface for up to five years. So this is why washing with soap and water is mission critical if you've come into contact with this. And that includes your clothing and anything else. And that includes your dog too. If, if your animals have touched this, now your animals won't get the burning rash. However, if that oil has been transferred to their fur, you pet them, you're going to get that oil. And of course, another fact, if this touches you and you have any serious reaction, especially if your eyes swell shut, you call 911. If you have a mild rash, take some oatmeal, add some water so it's pasty and apply it to the skin and you're going to get some relief. Another fact, poison ivy is not contagious. Again, it's the transfer of oils. The plant itself, the oils is the, the blistering, the reaction, that is not contagious. Now, it is said 15 to up to 25% of people are not affected when they touch the oils of this plant. Hence the reason you saw me touching this. I'm in that 15 to 25% group and I'm very fortunate. However, I do not take that for granted year after year. And every spring I will slightly touch this just to make sure I'm still in that group. Because the last thing I want to think is that I'm immune. I go traipsing through it and find out something has changed and I'm no longer immune. Here's a really cool fact about this plant. It's in the same family as cashews and mangoes. And if that's not a cool enough fact, this is actually used in homeopathic medicine for arthritis. Here's some really startling facts. Illinois Wesleyan University says that only one nanogram, which is a billionth of a gram, is needed to cause a rash. That's impressive. And the average person, if they touch this, is generally exposed to about 100 nanograms. One quarter ounce of urushiol 
is all that is needed, apparently, to cause a rash in every person on this planet. Again, that's just... <laughs> it's amazing. Those stats are amazing. And it's also said that 500 people can end up getting itchy from the amount of uretio that covers just the head of a pin. The name uretio is derived from urushi, which is Japanese for lacquer. And I think I did mention earlier, oh good, there's, I just saw, there's last year's berry growth. So these berries were not enjoyed by any wildlife. But there's some more. And these are a valuable source of food for several birds and mammals. And of course, once they eat it and they end up traveling and they end up defecating, we know what happens with those undigested seeds. And before I finish off, I'm going to show you some pictures of what skin can look like if you end up with poison ivy rash.